Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to be here. And um, so it's only Tuesday and we've already heard plenty about um, the, the depth and the ease of Michel's mathematical intuition and also um, his generosity in mentoring young mathematicians. So I'd rather not dwell on that. And instead of explaining, I will demonstrate. Uh, so I thought I would um, take this occasion to look back. Um, so um, Michelle and I uh, have been working together since 2013. Um, and so I thought I would um, give start with uh, from the beginning and tell you the story of our collaboration. And then um, I will talk about some um, partial work in progress at the end. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to tell the story of how Michelle and I started working together. Um, because I like this story, it's pretty funny, and I don't think many people know this. Uh, and um, so I'm just gonna reassure Michelle that, first of all, um, I won't name names. <laughs> and uh, second, I've actually asked for permission uh, to tell the story uh, from uh, one of the main characters, and uh, he granted it, so I'm in the clear. Uh, so this all started in uh, 2013 in MSRI, which is a, apparently a great uh, time for many of us. Uh, I was fresh out of my PhD and I was there as a postdoc. So as a postdoc at MSRI, you get assigned a mentor. And my mentor was uh, Sasha Polischuk. And uh, at the time I was trying to do something, something else entirely. And um, so we talked for a while and uh, it, was, it was very nice, it was very instructive. And then uh, Sasha had to leave uh, MSRI and he, he put me off to Michelle, who I think had arrived uh, maybe a bit later in the semester. Um, and so then the other thing that happened is um, every postdoc at MSRI has to give a talk. And I put that off uh, as long as I could because I was really concerned that nobody would be interested in what I had to say. Um, which is, so then what happened was um, I gave this talk that was probably, actually definitely hands down the most successful talk of my mathematical career and also one of my most successful uh, instances of procrastinating and doing something. Um, so I gave this talk and uh, the talk was uh, about finding or not finding. Um, well, let me, let me just write this down. So So I want to define a free MOKI functors for uh, the young people who may not know what they are. So, so you take X and Y and let me just take smooth projective right is even though this is not necessary. Over a field, then you have their product and two projections, P1 and P2, so X and Y, and then you take an object in the derived category of the product and you define by E as P2 lower star of E tensor P1 upper star of dash. Uh, and this is called a Fourier Mukai functor. And there is a result of Orlov that was sort of the starting point for 
what I was working on during my PhD, which is if f uh, from dbx to dby is fully faithful, then it is Okay, so it's isomorphic to a functor of this shape. And then the question is what happens? So this has been generalized uh, to um, much weaker um, conditions on X and Y, but then the question was what happens if the functor is not fully faithful? And this was an open question. And um, what happened uh, during my talk was I gave some partial results uh, that I'm gonna maybe tell a little bit more about later uh, that gave some kind of generic um, representability, generic Fremu kinase for in low dimension. And I thought it went reasonably well as far as stocks go. Um, and then what happened was the next day um, two other postdocs um, who were in my same, uh, also in the non commutative uh, geometry program, uh, came up to me and said, well, we solved it. We, we solved your thesis problem. Uh, so we, we, can prove, we can prove that all functors are Primo Uh Not only that, uh, but also, um, the proof is, is not hard and uh, it's basically done and we can write it down in a week. So, and uh, we can write a paper all together, which I thought was really nice of them, but also I was absolutely distraught uh, for many reasons. Uh, one of them was uh, I had unpublished research on this that of course was gonna be like completely superseded by this amazing result that they had. Um, and um, also, I didn't really understand their proof because it used a lot of math that I didn't know well. So they explained a little bit, but of course, uh, it was you know a lot of new things that I wasn't used to working with. And um, I was absolutely in a panic over this. Um, so. And of course I wasn't gonna have time in one week, right? To finish everything. So I thought, okay, I have to work day and night to like quickly post Anyway, it was, it was not a good time for me. Um, so then, uh, then I went to Michelle, who is now my mentor. And I said, well, this is a disaster. This is gonna completely derail my mathematical career. And he said, he said, huh, I would be surprised. So, so knowing what I know now, I should have mentally translated, I would be surprised into no chance, absolutely not. <laughs> but I guess at the time this was less clear and they were so confident. They were like, absolutely, yeah, totally. One week, it's already basically, it's gonna write itself. And uh, yeah. So I was like, look, they, they, they said they're sure. And he was like, yeah, fine, okay. I, I guess I should listen, listen to, to their proof. And then uh, we got all together, all the four of us. Uh, it took about 30 seconds for me <laughs> to find the mistake. <laughs> so that was the end of that. There was maybe a few stressful days, but um, in the end, it was probably for the best. And then, um, and then one thing that uh, Michelle explained to me was, well, at some point I, when I was explaining the thing that I didn't know how to do, he said, well, this thing, like this, this diagram that you wrote down and this thing that you don't know how to do, and that doesn't just look like something you don't know how to do, that looks like an abstraction. And, and indeed it is an abstraction. So, uh, so that's how things got started.
Yes. Okay, so so this was I was um, what I was trying to do uh, in that fateful talk. So I had a functor. This is beautiful chalk, by the way. I have, um, so let's start with an exact functor between uh, the two derived categories, and then let's pull it back to the derived category of the generic point of y. So just this is just a derived category of field. And let's for a moment forget that this is the derived category of k eta vector spaces. Let's just think of it in terms of the derived category. I guess I should delete this this b, but I can think of this as just derived category of, of k vector spaces. And then it's essentially um, a consequence of Brown representability um, that this composition is, you can write down as some phi e, um, where e is in uh, dbx. Um, so if I, if I revert to writing small, you should complain because I think I just did. So <laughs> I do apologize. Um, so, um, right, so this, uh, we got this by thinking of this as just a derived category of vector spaces, but because actually there's a bigger field here, um, E is going to have an action of this field K eta. And I'm going to put it here. One moment. Um. Um. Question. Here. That's the function field. Okay, cool. So, but now uh, this is not quite what I want. So what I want, what I would like is for E to sit in Oh, uh, maybe here, uh, because then um, I can actually lift this to something in db x cross y. Um, and then, so if I could get that, then here I would have a five e prime. Um, between db of x and db of y, such that these two functors may not agree, but they do agree after pushing forward, uh, pulling back to the generic point. So, so in other words, I have Um, a forgetful functor like this. Uh, where this here, the action of K is on the level of coherent sheaves and here it's on the level of the derived categories. And I think by now, maybe, I think right now maybe I'm more authoritative than I used to be. But um, when I was younger, I had such a hard time to convince people that this is not obviously 
the same. Um, and in fact, um, so what I could do is I could do it um, in low dimension. So I could take something over here, over here and lift it over here. Um, I can do this uh, in low dimension essentially by hand, but I, uh, in higher dimension, I was having a, a lot of trouble with it. So it turns out that I couldn't do it because in higher dimension, there is an obstruction. So if something lives over here, you may not be able to lift it over here. This functor is not essentially subjective. Um, and so, um, so in a nutshell, this is still um, the most general way that we have to prove uh, if you have a fun if we have a, a, a functor that is a candidate uh, for a non Fourier Mukai functor, this is still uh, essentially the idea behind uh, how to prove it. So let me just write this down. Uh, say, so say you want to prove. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, so I didn't say this, but maybe I should have. Uh, so that, yeah, it's not true that all functors are, are Fui Mukai. And, but I think this was already given away by the title and the abstract. So yeah, um, so I will explain later how we can construct functors that are non Fui Mukai, but so once, we, once we have constructed them, this is how you actually prove that they're not free Mukai. Uh, yeah, in, in some very special situations, you can do it in other ways, but but this is the the most um, uh, the most general way. So so you take t in dbx, and for example, and you assume there is a a nice algebra that acts on t. So for example, uh, T could be a tilting bundle and gamma could be its algebra endomorphisms. Then, then T is in uh, the derived category coherence is on X, but also there's an action of gamma. And it is definitely in this case, I mean, T is the tilting bundle. So this, this action of gamma is, is, is really just on the level of um, of sheaves on the level of complexes, and then you forget it. You forget. You forget it was on the level of complexes, and you put it on the level of the derived category. So this is that forgetful functor is the same forgetful functor that I had over here, uh, which looks like it's gonna be fine, but sometimes it's not fine. So. Now let's take our uh, functor f. And so this goes to db co y. Uh, but essentially by functoriality, there's also an action of gamma here on the level of the derived category. And here, I can put the action inside. Um, so, if f were Fourier Mukai, so all the operations that are involved in constructing a Fourier Mukai functor are operations that happen on the level of complexes. So if f were Fourier Mukai, it would lift to a functor uh, on this top level. Uh, so you take t, you send it here, and then you send it here. And then, as I said, there are some obstructions. To lifting. And the obstructions to lifting, so these are in Hochschild 
cohomology. Uh, so anyway, the indices are not important. Um, and if the, well, in some cases we can compute explicitly these obstructions. And if you're, if you're like construct this functor in a way that is cunning enough, these obstructions are going to be non zero. And then you know that the functor cannot be free Mukai because otherwise you would be able to just send it over here and this diagram commutes. Ah, and I can't write over there. Okay. Right, so this is, this is how you check if something is or isn't for Mukai, but how do you actually construct no free Mukai functor? Uh, and again, so we want to construct these in a way that is uh, set up so that these abstractions have a chance to be computable and a chance to uh, be non zero. So, because the abstractions are in Hoxha homology, that's what we want to use. So, we're going to use um, the Hochschild cohomology of X to the form X, or more precisely to the form a category associated to X. So you start with X and you cook up a category out of it. This is a category capturing uh, the information of, of an affine covering. And then this is, so this is work of uh, Wendy and Michelle. Uh, there's an embedding from the derived category of, of X to the derived category of this chi. So this is fully faithful and the Hochschild cohomology doesn't change. So if I take a bimodule on X, that's the same as taking the Hochschild cohomology of the corresponding uh, bimodule on, on chi. And this chi is now just a category. Right, so, so we're gonna use now this to, to deform X. Okay, so we're going to take this this guy and we're going to deform it, and we're going to deform it to an infinity category. So, uh, so the most uh, well known thing that you can do with partial cohomology is to deform an algebra. So you take something in HH two uh, and you use it to deform your algebra, and you can do the same with. HH2 of a category and just deform the category in the same way, you're gonna get about a character a category. So for so for us, M is going to be greater or equal three. Uh, and you can do the same thing, except instead of 
uh, getting back a category, you get back an infinity category. And uh, inf so an infinity algebra is something that would like to be a DG algebra, except it doesn't quite make it because um, multiplication is not associative. So it's only associative up to a higher homotopy. And then the higher homotopy uh, also works out of the higher, the higher homotopy and I have infinitely many of these. And um, so it turns out the formalism is the same as, as the DG formalism is just uh, more flexible because you have infinitely many multiplications. And the same thing is, is works for category. Uh, so, so we can do this for three up to twice the dimension of X, uh, which is the, the Hochschild dimension of, uh, of Chi. Um, and what happens is we still have our category. Uh, this, these are the, so I'm going to write down the, the X. So we still have the, the, the X that we used to have. So that like the home zero uh, sits in degree zero. And then there's a bunch of zeros here. Um, but then there's something sitting in very negative. And we can make this, this degree as negative, well, pretty negative. So this is degree zero and this is degree minus m plus two. And this gap is going to be really important for us. So I'm going to, I'm going to write this down now because I'm gonna get back to this later. So if m is greater or equal the dimension of x plus three, uh, then the gap is greater or equal dimension of x. And I, I don't think I ever quite succeeded to convey how important this gap is, but maybe I will succeed today. You can always hope. So, so now you want to construct a functor from this derived category, this chi, to the right category of this chi eta. So let me first. Let me first say it for rings. So for rings, the corresponding things would be to construct a functor from the derived category of a ring to the derived category of a deformed ring. And essentially, you can do this by prescribing that R goes to uh, the deformed R. Uh, and then once you've done this, uh, you can, so the first step is to, um, to define this map on projective uh, R modules. Then the, the corresponding first step for, uh, in this situation is a bit more complicated and it follows work of Genovese, Lowen Vandenberg. Uh, so what they did is they constructed this map. So this functor that goes from the objective uh, objects in coherent X to the derived category of chi eta. And this has a property that will be important for us. Uh, no.
So in degree zero, I just got back home my j. And I have zero in i greater than zero. And for i smaller than zero, I could have more stuff. Uh, the shift, shift. So we have, a, we have a factor on injectives or in the case of rings and dually on, on projectives. And uh, we want to extend it to uh, to the whole derived category. Uh, and so, the original proof that Michelle and I had uh, wrote down uh, was obtained by uh, first extending uh, this L to the whole derived category and then constructing L on the, on the derived category by um, uh, getting it as left, left inverse of some truncation function. And then Anna Neumann was the referee for he was the referee for our paper, and then in the span of I, I don't remember it was it's a while ago I don't remember how long it took, but it was very fast. And he wrote back saying, "Actually, I have a better proof," um, and so uh, he he wrote a much nicer proof using um, working inductively and using two structures, um, and that's that's the proof that is in our paper now. Okay, so I'm not gonna... Okay, so you extend it in one of these two ways and then putting this all together, you get the functor from dBx to db by eta. And this is exact. And this is a very general construction. Uh, and then of course we're not done and we have to go back to uh, some derived category of some smooth projective variety to this to be uh, interesting for most people. Uh, and this we can now do in several ways. So the original, in the original paper we had db of q to db of p4. Uh, so this is exact and non-free Mukai. Ah, yes, sorry. I couldn't read my own handwriting. Uh, so, um, so this was the first example of an exact factor between the derived category of two super nice smooth projective varieties um, that is known for a Mukai functor. And this is the first, so this is the first kind of counter example that I will be talking about. Ah, uh, yes, uh, Q is a quadric, a uh, quadric hypersurface. Q. And so it's, it's the first interesting counterexample, not just because uh, it gives a functor that is not for Mukai, but also because it, it provides an example of a functor that uh, doesn't lift to a, a functor between enhancements. So uh, the derived categories of smooth projective varieties have an enhancement and you can take your favorite kind. Uh, for example, a DG enhancement. Um, 
So on objects, uh, this works very well, and there's a perfect vocabulary between the level of the triangulated categories and the level of the enhancements. But for functors, it, this, is, this shows that this, this doesn't work. Um, and so as it turns out, uh, this doesn't just give us some insight about the interplay between uh, triangulated categories and their enhancement, but also in the way that this interplay is influenced by the geometry of the varieties. So this was one example, and it was just one example because uh, these abstractions I was talking about in the beginning are actually kind of hard to, uh, to work with. Uh, but since then, uh, we can do more. So first of all, I want to mention uh, work by Felix Kuhn, who's my PhD student who graduated a few months ago, some, some amount of months ago. So he managed to generalize this to uh, functors. So he constructed functors between the derived category of smooth quadric hypersurfaces in P2n for n greater than 2. And this is exact enough for Imokai. And if you, so this is very nice because you sort of got a whole family of functors that are known for Imuka. This is not, this is showing that this is not an isolated example. And if you are okay with losing a bit of control over what's going on, Yeah, actually, I'm just, I'm going to write over here so I can write bigger. So you take x, a variety of dimension greater or equal three with a tilting bundle. Mm. Then there exists an exact non-free Mackay functor uh, from dbx to dby for some y smooth projective scheme. But uh, so this construction completely loses control of this y. So this, yeah, so I think this result is much nicer because it keeps, uh, there's a nice x and a nice y. And here uh, you make it more general at the cost of this y could be very high dimensional. Okay, so that's many of them. There's probably a lot more. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that the same construction brings us uh, more counterexamples. Uh, so one more result uh, that Michelle and I have is the following. So you take, uh, this is gonna be a little bit ugly, I'm sorry. So you take, the derived category function field in, in the n variables, and you send it to the derived category of k adjoined the same n variables, and then 
uh, you still want to deform it in the same way that, way that I was doing earlier. And you take n greater or equal 14. Um, and then in this situation, we can glue along this functor. Uh, so like this, let's pull this L again. So this gives us a triangulated category. Over a field of characteristic zero even without an enhancement. So because you're gluing along this functor that cannot be enhanced, it's sort of clear that the result is gonna be dodgy. And in fact, it is, so it's, it's, it's an actual theorem um, that this works. And so a natural question is, uh, why do we have, why do we have those things? Why don't we just do it on, on db co x and db co y, uh, which is something, yeah. Uh, which is, I mean, yeah, I don't know, like to me, that looks pretty ugly, um, but, uh, but that's what we needed for it to work. And the reason why is that uh, gluing is one of those things that you cannot do purely on the level of triangulated categories, you need more structure. So to perform so the, to perform the gluing, we need a structure of a n functor for l. Uh, where an an functor is a functor that would like to be an infinity but doesn't quite make it, so it works well um, in the first few degrees, and then um, the higher operations just break everything. Um, so, so an an functor is the same as a truncated. A infinity, a infinity function. Um, and so why can we do this in that situation? Just because the source is the derived category of a field and the derived category of a field behaves really well. So in that case, uh, I mean, it's, it's very simple, right? We can, uh, we can do things uh, in, in a much simpler way, uh, but we couldn't, uh, we couldn't get that to work uh, for db co. And so we tried, Michelle and I tried years ago uh, to make, yes, to make this functor, to make this L work at the IN level. So give it a bit more structure. And uh, we didn't, it didn't work out at all. And let me show you why. So, so first of all, let me explain why this should be the case. Uh, 
and then I'll show you what goes wrong. So the intuition is that a non free Mukai functor is the same as an AN functor that does not lift. to an infinity functor. And let me just say this intuition is wrong as, as written. It's, uh, but it's, it's close enough. It's close enough to the truth. It's close, and, it's close enough for this conversation. And, and one reason for this is that uh, if you take, so, let me take two infinity categories A and B. And a functor between them, which is a n functor for n greater or equal five, then H zero of F is exact. So that's what, so in my opinion, that's what we should be striving for, right? We should be striving for a, an a n functor that is at least a five, and then it gives us an exact functor on the level of the derived categories. And um, if we do it in a smart way, so in a way that uh, can be completed to an infinity functor, this should, uh, this would be, a source of non free Mukai functors. So what happens if we try to do this um, for our functor that up there? So we start out well. So we have, this goes from the injectives to the derived category of chi eta. And I have regrets because I deleted uh, the picture of negative x, but I'm, I'm gonna write it again. So, so the negative x for chi eta, remember were like this, where I had a big gap uh, here and here I had my chi. And this was degree zero and this was degree uh, minus n plus two. So you can think of this as an A1 functor. And then there exist obstructions. to lifting to an AI functor. So uh, you have iterative obstructions and this, so the ith obstruction lives in the ith partial cohomology of inch A H minus I plus two of chi eta. So, uh, and the first one is for i equal three, uh, because um, you can always, uh, anytime you have an a one functor, you can you can lift it to an a two functor. That's that's okay. Um, and then to lift it to an a three, a four, and so on, you start having to check these obstructions. And so, but notice, uh, so for, for i equal three, this is h minus one. So it's here. And here we conveniently have this zero. Uh, so this, this, uh, this is where the, oh, the third obstruction, so the first relevant obstruction lives. 
And then I have a bunch of zero here for a bunch of abstractions. And so this gives me an A two dimension of X functor. So this still goes from injectives in A to uh, what do I want to write here? Um, So chi eta uh, modules, infinity chi eta modules. And now you think, okay, we're in business because uh, this is a lot. This is a lot of anus and we can take dimension of X to be very big. So it looks like we're doing well. Oh no, it's very late. Looks like we're doing well. And then um, uh, what you want to do is you want to um, add a bunch of things. So um, to, to get from the objectives to extend to the whole derived categories, you need um, all uh, direct sums um, and then shifts and then cones. And so shifts and direct sums, it's okay. You can just like extend linearly, that's fine. And then, so I'm going to write free as taking direct sums and shifts, and that's okay, you can do. And then you have to add cones. And you don't even have to add all the cones, you have to add that amount of cones, which is equal to the dimension of X. So this is called taking twisted complexes for people in the know, but if you don't know twisted complexes, it's still okay. Uh, and then the question is how much anus is left. Uh, so it turns out if you take the correct amount of cones, so you started with two dimension of X and then to take the cones, how much do you lose? You lose minus dimension of X plus one divided dimension of X and then you take the floor. So that gives you one. Uh, so we got an A1 functor. That's not great. Give me three minutes. Sorry, is that okay? Sorry. So, uh, so the question is, can we do better? Um, and the answer is maybe. Uh, and as I said, this is work in progress. So what looks like it works is extending to A. Um, so what do we need to extend this functor, this functor here uh, to a functor from, from the whole A um, to uh, K, A infinity K the modules? Um, so we need dimension of X shifts and dimension of X cones. Um, and the game here is try not to completely ruin uh, those zeros over there. So what happens when you start adding shifts? So every time I add a shift, I can, I have to add it in both directions, right? And so I lose one, uh, I lose one zero here on the left and one zero here on the right. Um, and so uh, once I have added some shifts, direct sums are fine. That's not uh, something that we need to be worried about this. So once I've added some shifts, uh, I can start adding cones and cones are pretty disastrous 
as I showed you over there, because you lose a lot of anus. However, uh, if you still have zeros here, you can regain some. Now, if I want to add the correct, like put in the correct amount of shifts, I need dimension of x shifts, right? So, so this looks bad because this is in dimension. So the, the biggest the gap uh, that I can have is minus two dimension of x plus two. Uh, and so I'm losing these zeros over here and these zeros over there. And it looks not great. However, we are saved by the really nice shapes of the derived injectors because in degree zero, we just have the morphisms that come from our source. Uh, and so what happens here in, in um, low negative uh, degree, what happens here is I only have morphisms that get that come from um, shifts of this. And so, um, do I still have, ah, yes. So I still have uh, this shape of the obstructions. And so if this, if I still had zeros, I would be in great shape. Uh, I don't have zeros anymore, but I can still compute these obstructions and I could still get lucky. And indeed I do because uh, for, degree, for degree reasons, the only arrows um, in, where do you go? The only arrows in here that can contribute to the obstructions are shifts of arrows that live in degree zero. And these come from our source. So they can't contribute to an obstruction. So I still have a bunch of obstructions here that are enough for dimension of X sufficiently large. Actually, I think dimension of X at least three. Yeah. Okay. So this is not this is not enough uh, to conclude. So you still. Um, So it looks like this works, uh, but we still have to extend uh, to the whole derived category. Um, so further. EBA. And if this works, uh, this would give us a third counter example. Uh, because we would be able to glue um, the derived category of the source and the, the derived category of X and the derived category of Y for two along a functor for two smooth projective varieties. And this would give us an example of a triangulated category with a bounded to structure. Um, so it has a bounded to structure because both both of them do and these structures glue at the level of the triangulated categories and this does not admit an enhancement. And this was a question by uh, Amnon actually asked me. I'm so sorry for running over time. Thank you. I'll shut up.